We're in a series called At the Table, and last week, Chris and I kicked it off. He did amazing. It was so good, uh, and I encourage you, if you didn't listen to it, go back. You can listen to it at awakeningchurch.com or iTunes podcast and some of those things. Uh, go listen to it. And we've talked about the open table, and what we're doing with this series is just talking about the table that Jesus set and what, we're, what we learn from that and what we know about Jesus and, and what he did on, uh, on this planet was he flung wide the, uh, the gates of the kingdom of God and said, all are welcome. The, the, it's completely open. Come. Come all who are weary. Come all who are just where you're at. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, you are welcome. This morning, we're going to talk about uh, this idea of no empty seats okay so if the if jesus says hey i have an open table here's what we need to know god's heart god's desire is that there are no empty seats at the table uh in fact uh second peter 2 9 i think it is don't quote me on it you can google it later uh but it says this that um that the lord is not slow in keeping his commands as some think he is slow or his promises uh, but he is patient not longing for anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Like God's heart, God's desire, when it comes to his intimacy with you, his, his, his communion with you, with, with you getting to have a seat at the table, his heart is that there would be no empty seats. In fact, why don't you just do that? This is going to be weird, and if you hate the like meet and greet time, you're going to hate this. Would you just say to the person next to you, no empty seats? Would you just go ahead and say that? Go, go for it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, this morning, I actually want to begin with the end, the application. So what do we do with what we've heard? And you'll understand why as we get into the message. But let me give you the application and the application is simply this. Here at Awakening, we have a seat for you at the table. Here at Awakening, now, we have a seat for you. We, we want you to have a seat at the table in growing in your relationship with Jesus right here in this context. Here's what it looks like at Awakening. Uh, at Awakening, we have groups. Now, how many of you remember missional communities? Just raise your hand so I know who I'm talking to. Okay, like, wow, that's crazy. No, go ahead, raise them up because I'm, yeah. So we're talking like a third. So two-thirds of you have no idea. So we used to do a thing last year called missional communities. And here's, they were midweek, small groups growing together to become more like Jesus. Now here was the problem with missional communities. No one really knew what they were. Because if you're brand new and you hear missional community, you're like, what is that? And that sounds kind of intense. And does it mean that we have to, like, be on mission every time we gather? What do we do? It was a little confusing. And then we had insider language. So we'd say MC, like, join an MC. And like, what is an MC? I didn't know what missional community was. Now you're saying join an MC. What is that? Even some people are like, yeah, um, this church is kind of weird. Like, everybody wants to be an MC. Like, I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to MC the room. And so we decided, okay, we're going to change it to awakening group same thing different name just clear her got it this means yes this means no perfect 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 so here's what it is a seat at the table a small group of people maybe anywhere between five to twelve people who are committed if you got your notes and you got those would you circle that word committed seriously one of the missing links in your spiritual formation for many I see in this day and age is the inability to actually commit and work through things with people. And you stunt your spiritual growth and you actually stunt your intimacy not only with others but with God because that is the formation process that God longs to use to refine us and help us become more like Jesus. A small group of people who are committed saying, hey, I'm in it. Not forever. This isn't a forever thing, but for, let's just say, for the fall. Can we commit to three months for the fall to growing together? Now, how? To become more like Jesus. Every time I get up to preach, I have one aim. Every single time. My aim is somehow in this moment in our time together that, that I'd help form Christ in you. 
that, that you would walk in and you would hear from God's word and you'd walk out and you'd begin to be a responder to his word and you would look and we would look as a community a little bit more like Jesus. And what happens is in this larger gathering, often what happens is this is a moment for inspiration. This is a moment where that worship song, man, God just spoke to you. That, that one moment where someone like greeted you, it just did something. That, that where the message connected is for inspiration. Small groups are the environments where we see transformation most often take place. You come, man, you begin to hear God's word, and then you get into a smaller group and go, okay, we're going to center this group not around our CrossFit. We're going to center this group not around our soul cycle. We're going to center this group not around fantasy football, which I love, by the way. We're going to center this group around Jesus. And we're going to be a community gathered together, growing to become more like Jesus. And so here's the application. Here's the question. In fact, if you got your black card would you pull it out for me if you need a pen i got guys with pens kind of sounds ominous right but would you commit to growing as a follower of jesus this fall in a group would you commit to growing this fall uh, uh in a group and here's what i want you to do with the black card for some you've never been in a community i think i have a black card over here and that you would just write your name your email if you're going, I've never been in a group, or you're a college student, and you're going like, hey, I come to the second service, and I want free lunch, startup is your place, <laughs> right? And so you fill out your name, your email, and then just put connect track if you want to go to startup. It's just the entryway to groups in our church. And if you want to dive in and say, I want to join a group, or I'm in a group, but I haven't told anybody, you just write uh, connect midweek group. If you have a specific day or days, you can write that down in the little notes, and then on your way out, drop it off at the connection table. And we have groups happening at all times. We have mornings group, men's groups, women's groups, evening groups, married groups. We have lots and lots of groups. We have a group for you. I was kind of getting into kind of like a little um, Dr. Seuss there. Uh, it was in my head. That's what was happening. All right, so that's the application. Here's the, that's the application for us, that we wouldn't just be a church with groups, that are, but we'd be a church of groups, living out our call, growing as followers of Jesus. Now, here's what I, I want to wrestle with for the remainder of our time. Why is it? Why is it that we don't commit to growing as followers of Jesus? I don't know if you've ever wrestled with that. Like, for many of you, you've had this moment that, that God has changed you, that you encountered Jesus, and, and, and maybe it was last year, maybe it was many years ago, maybe it was as a kid, may, maybe you're in the investigative process, but, but why is it that in the valley where we live, in the culture that we live, that, that if we're honest, we, we, uh, we don't necessarily commit to this growing as followers of Jesus. I'm not even just talking about in groups, but I'm just talking about personally. What, what is the the roadblocks or the barriers in our life. Maybe a better question is, what is it that keeps us from the table of Jesus? If it's really true that, that with Jesus, he flung wide the gates, that God's desire that there is no empty seats for you in this season, where you're at, what is it that's keeping you from tabling, from experiencing deep intimacy and oneness with the God who loves you, with a Savior who pursued you. Um, Jesus was invited to a, uh, to a dinner party. And the group looked not so unlike kind of the middle upper class of Silicon Valley. I know many of us aren't in that class, but we've seen that class and we're surrounded by it. But, but this group, we often kind of attribute them to a, a religious part and miss out on the social part. He, he's invited to this dinner party, and, and if I could just paint a picture for what this group is like, it's they are the highest educated in their day, in their city. Uh, they have the best of the best. They live in the nicest house. They're the most affluent. They're the most influential. They're, they're very image-driven. 
I don't know anybody in Silicon Valley who's image-driven or on social media wondering and curious about how they're presenting themselves, but this group certainly was. They, they are ones who, you know, threw the best parties, had the best things. They're the people, honestly, that if you were of the not group, you hated them and wanted to be them at the same time. You're like, oh, I can't believe, oh, they're the worst. I wish I had that, right? If we brought it into our modern-day context, maybe they're Insta-famous, right? Maybe they're the lifestyle brand people. They're like, how are they living that and getting paid to do that? And I'm not. They're the haves among the have-nots. And Jesus is invited into this dinner party, and here's what he does. It's so amazing. He expertly diagnoses the heart issues, the root issues for this group. I would say the Silicon Valley environment of what is keeping them at arm's length or missing out on Jesus. If you got your Bibles, you open them up to Luke chapter 14. I'm going to talk this morning about four excuses that keep us from Jesus, that keep us from intimacy with Jesus, that keep us from the table of Jesus, that keep us at arm's length of, of why it always feels like we're just not quite connected. Pick it up in chapter 14, verse 1 of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it writes, one Sabbath, and by the way, in Luke's Gospel, anytime you see Sabbath, your, your ears should kind of perk up. S the Sabbath in his day, or Luke's writing, always had some controversy around it. Jesus always did some things that the religious leaders disagreed with on the Sabbath. In fact, this is the fourth Sabbath controversy in Luke's gospel. He says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. This is a ruling religious leader. These are the best and the brightest. Th these are the social elite. He was being watched carefully. In fact, that word carefully is, is to watch like a hawk. We, we find out in Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 53 and 54, that, uh, that they had decided that they were going to kill him, and they are watching intensely to see whatever Jesus does to make sure, okay, how can we catch this guy because he's really messing up what we have going, and we don't like it. That's pretty much the end of the story there. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Uh, and maybe some of your translations say he has dropsy. That's the old kind of term for this disease. If you look it up online, if you Google it, there's some disturbing images of what dropsy is. And it's this swelling and this fluid that gushes to your body. Uh, and so like your arms and your legs will just be double the size, incredibly painful, and you think in their day, they always tried to attribute, well, how did this person get this? Uh, the rabbis of the day attributed dropsy or the swelling of the body to sexual immorality. And so this man not only is suffering physically, but he is shut out spiritually from the community around him. And some scholars think that, that they actually planted this man right at the beginning to try to catch Jesus. We don't know, but it wouldn't be beyond their uh, reasoning that they would do this. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Huh. Well, we already know in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is healed on the Sabbath. And he's addressing it one more time. The group that's watching him, Jesus is now catching them in their own hypocrisy. But they remain silent. So taking hold of the man love that line, by the way. Think about this man who's been ostracized from community. Who knows the last time he's been touched. When you look at his physical ailment, you think, well, man, there's no, there's no way. No way I'm going to touch that, because maybe that could get on me. Who knows the last time he'd been touched. And Jesus takes hold of him, humanizes him. He could have just spoke and healed him, no problem. He's done that before. And yet he wants to communicate his intimate touch and love to this man who's being pointed out in the most awful way. Then, taking him and holding him, he heals him and sends him away. Then he asked him, 
if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately put it out? And now notice that it says, and they had nothing to say. At first, they remained silent. They didn't want to speak. The second, they couldn't speak. See, the Sabbath is a holy day for the Jewish community, a day set apart to honor God. And there's all these rules and restrictions that began to be placed on of how to actually live that out. In fact, I remember when I was in Israel a long time ago, uh, they had what was known as a Shabbat elevator. Like, you can't even press the numbers on the elevator. That would be considered work. Uh, and so you would get into the elevator, and it would have all the numbers pressed on Saturday. And so you just had to write up, because if you pressed a button, that was considered work. Now, in the Mosaic Law, there was a concession if something happened to your family or happened to your livestock that you could go and help and bring healing. And Jesus is applying that and taking their own law and saying, guys, do you not get this? Jesus, in his expert way, diagnosing some of the root issues going on. And I think the first excuse that keeps us at arm's length from Jesus, that keeps us from tabling with him, is that it's just too personal. It's personal. It, it, it's invasive, isn't it? I mean, Jesus gets to the heart of the issue right away. It's, it's uncomfortable. It's exposing. You, you know, one of the things I love about this is, is Jesus goes everywhere he's invited. Do you see that? He was invited to a Pharisee's home. He was invited to a group that has pre-decided to kill him, and he goes there anyways. Jesus goes everywhere he's invited. However, however, he will always address the hard issues. And I think that's why we kind of keep Jesus at arm's length, because it's personal. It's exposing. It's like, oh my goodness, I don't want you to see all my junk. In fact, one of the things I love about Jesus going everywhere he's invited, if you got your Bibles, if you just look at the beginning, chapter 14, verses 1 and through 3, we see him invited to the Pharisee's house. He goes there, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we see him dining with tax collectors and sinners. He says, wherever you invite me, there I am going. And for some, you walked in, and you've kept God at arm's length because Let's be honest, you've just been doing religious gymnastics. And for others, you feel like, man, your background in your life and what's going on, God wouldn't want you. And the truth of the matter is, is yes, is when you encounter Jesus, it is deeply personal. He, he's going to talk to you. He's going he's gonna to bring up some stuff. And the point is, is he longs to bring healing. He longs to bring reconciliation. He longs to bring wholeness to your life. And until we become real and go, okay, it's going to be personal, we will never table with Jesus. Ironically, isn't it, that we live in such a world that drives for authenticity, you know, that's what we want. You've got to be authentic. And we smell the, you know, disauthenticity. Let's see if that's a word. From a mile away. And yet what we really want to do is we hide, don't we? We hide behind social media. We hide behind our activity. We hide behind quick answers. How are you doing? Fine. Good. We hide behind coming to church late and leaving early because it's personal. We don't want to be exposed. The first excuse that keeps us from Jesus is, per is that it's personal. The second excuse, then look at what Jesus is doing. Uh, verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Uh-oh, I just got to tell you, uh, this is not like one of those... Um, 
those parties that you're going, I'm so glad we invited Jesus to, <laughs> you know? We just wanted to have a good time. He shows up, but we wanted to trap him, and now Jesus is going to call us out. And now he's watching, he's seeing how people are taking their seat at the table. Now, now the way people were seated in that day were, is a similar way that weddings work in our day. You know, you have the groom and the bride right at the front. You have the wedding party next to them. And the most important people are seated closest, and the least important people are seated furthest away. And so if you're seated close to the host, you are considered the most important person at the table. And if you're way down at the end, you're considered the least important person at the table. Well, nobody wants to be the least important person at the table. And so they're jockeying for position, trying to get as close to the host as possible. He goes on, he tells them this party. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll take the least important place. I don't know if you've ever had that experience before, but maybe perhaps you have. I've maybe had this experience, I'm not going to say. But perhaps you've been flying and you thought you could perhaps fly first class, but you didn't have a ticket for first class. And so you sat in first class hoping that you wouldn't be noticed. And then eventually the stewardess comes up to you and says, um, excuse me, sir, uh, this is not your seat and your seat's back there and you're taking the walk of shame back this is the point jesus is making here don't position yourself to take the walk of shame but when you're invited take the lowest place so that when your host uh, uh, comes he will say to you friend move up to a better place then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests now here's what jesus is doing he's going to take a very physical um example and make the deeper spiritual principle for for all who are exalt who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted jesus said it maybe in a different way you've heard before the first will be last and the last will be first as long as you're trying to exalt yourself, as long as you're trying to prove that you're important, as long as you're trying to get everyone to accept you, you're not going to experience the table of Jesus. In fact, you're going to miss so much in your own life. Another way we might say this, and, and i got to say, you're going to argue with this, okay? So if the first excuse, the reason we keep Jesus at at arm's length is it's personal. The second is, I'm too important. And what's funny is I just said that and not one of you identified with that. You're like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. We would never say that out loud. And yet, if we look at how we live our lives, the desire to be important often is what drives us. The desire for others' approval, the desire to be successful, the desire for others to say we're needed. In fact, for some, your work, whether it's at school or at your job, the, the reason you can't say no is when they say, hey, we need you, it makes you feel in." And as a result, you sacrifice moments with Jesus. You sacrifice the community with Jesus to be important. You know, I see this happening um, with young people, with young believers, millennials, in this context. Uh, I, they say things like this. I just wrote down a few of them. I see having uh, this sense of arrival. I've already made it. Like an attainment. I see it where it's this, I'm beyond that. Like, yeah, yeah, that's good, but I, I'm actually beyond that. I'm unwilling to do what's needed. I, you know what? That job, that issue, that need within the church is below me. I am way gifted. Don't you see it? See it this way in search of a new search of a deeper 
the sense of entitlement, serve me, meet my needs. I don't need community. I've done that before. All those areas have to do with this entitled sense, I'm important, or I want to be important. And it holds you back from Jesus. You know, a couple years ago, we did this study in our missional communities, now called groups, called Alpha. And, and it really, it's geared towards a group gro- going together and inviting people who don't know Jesus in, but it covers core doctrines of the faith. One of the things I heard from many people was, I already know this. And I just thought like, oh man, you missed this. See, often what we come on Sunday to hear is something new. Something deep, whatever that means, I'm not really sure. Something clever. Scratch my itch. But I I just got to be honest. The deepest, most profound verse has been the same verse for me for over 20 years. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. I got to tell you, that wrecks me. Like to this day, like I can barely say that without being broken, that the God of the universe loves me. Like when that becomes commonplace, we've missed it. When that becomes like, yeah, whatever, I'm beyond that, that's called pride. Pride. And the word of God is so deep and so rich and so beautiful that you can sit with one verse your entire life and still get something new and profound out of it. But when you have the sense of arrival, you will miss what God has for you. You know, um, the sense of importance translates into how we do community together and how we treat other people. Imagine, imagine if you, if you just looked at whoever was in front of you and you had this insatiable curiosity about them. I, imagine if you looked at them and just you were expecting to be amazed by them. Instead of looking at them, they're too young. They have nothing to teach me. They're too old. They don't know anything about the Internet. I could Google that. They're too whatever. They're too homeless. They're too whatever. And you begin to go, okay. No, no. They're an image bearer of the God Most High, and I can position my heart as one of deeply curious and begin to... approach every single person, every single small group, every single environment of like, I'm just expecting to be amazed in this moment. Like, I'm going to sit and have this conversation. I can't wait to be amazed by you. I can't wait to learn from you. First is people. It's too personal. Second thing that keeps us at arm's bay. Now, we never say it this way. I'm too important. We pick it up. Third excuse, chapter, uh, verse 12. Then Jesus said to the host, golly, can you imagine this? I mean, it starts from the outside. He's addressing this, you know, the group as a whole. Then he's starting to address the entire table that's gathered there. And then he points out the host. This is going to be fun. Everyone's going like, great, who invited this guy? Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, which is what he's doing, Do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors, which is what he did. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, what's interesting is in the ancient day, they didn't have a whole lot of entertainment. These massive and big banquets were not just the entertainment for those who were invited. It was actually the entertainment for 
the community or the town. And so what would happen is not all banquets, but many of the large banquets, much like a prominent Pharisee who wants to have social standing, wants to reveal and show off what he has and what you don't have and how good he is and how not good you are, these these banquets would be held in the courtyard, uh, and there would be the table set before and all the food brought out, and, and they would have all the invited guests lounging and reclining and there'd be this conversation that's going on talking about you know whether it's deep theological things the happenings of the day whatever the host would often you know lead or direct and what the community would come out and they would surround this and watch they wouldn't speak it gives you the context for the woman who breaks free from the crowd and begins and when jesus is reclining at another pharisee's home and begins to wash his feet So when Jesus is saying this, the poor and the cripples, the community, is watching this group eat, listening to what's going on. Mm. And I think he highlights one of the reasons that we often shy away from this type of community or intimacy with Jesus. It's excuse number three is just simply that it's too messy. It's too messy. Like, like it's, like people are messy, aren't they? No, no, no. I'm messy. You're messy. In fact, we're all a mess. You know what's beautiful about this community and this gathering? Is one, you look beautiful. You, you really do. You're a very good-looking crew, ab- above average, I would say. And you know what else? Not one person in this room is perfect. Every single one of us is a mess. Every single one of us has a background and a baggage that we're carrying around. Has a family history has an addiction, has, what, has issues that are going on underneath the surface. You know, my wife, she said this um, years ago. It was our first ministry, full-time ministry, and I was a youth pastor. And uh, after our first year of full-time ministry, my wife had this line. It was so good. You know, ministry was easy before we really got to know people. Isn't that true? You know, the first year was awesome, it was easy. It was just like, hey, how are you? Awesome, how are you? Cool. And then you're doing life with people, and, you, and then the mess begins to bubble up. And, and you begin to have to deal with that. And you're like, oh, man, you know, oh, your marriage isn't doing good. Oh, this relationship, oh, that addiction, oh, this issue over here. Oh, oh finance, oh, my goodness. By the way, This is the reason some of you have been stuck. Because you have this cycle. Is that you will attend a church for about one to two years. And in that process, it begins with that church is awesome. They're great. The worship's great. Oh, the teaching's great. And then all of a sudden, you get to know people. And it gets messy. Remember I had you circle that word committed. And then two years... You go try another church, and we watch this in the church time after time. Uh, when you go, okay, I'm in here two years, it's awesome. And then all of a sudden, you get some friction, you get some messes that come. And it's true. Man, if you're going to do life with some people, and you're going to center on Jesus, it's personal. And then we have to realize, hey, I'm going to be insatiably curious about you and not about my own importance here. And all of a sudden, the messes come to the table, and we begin to have to walk through the mess together. And you know what your mess reminds me of? It reminds me that I'm a mess. <laughs> and I'd prefer to kind of just push that down and not deal with it. And Jesus invites you to a table to do life with others, and it's in the one another life that he begins to heal, he begins to restore, he begins to do the deep work in your soul. And as long as you go, like, no, it's just too messy, you will miss out. And nothing is more harmful for your soul 
than to put on the church shiny plastic grin and say, fine. Now, you can't be Eeyore either. Some of you are like, life's terrible. I'm a mess. Okay, I'm going to go eat worms. Right? That, that's not what we're talking about either. But, but we're talking about, hey, we embrace. You're a mess. I'm a mess. And Jesus actually invites us messy to the table. And we get to do life together. And it's in that place, in that process, that he wants to do his deep healing work in you. All right, excuse number three, four. We got, it's too personal, I'm too important, it's too messy. Verse 15, when those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now, this is what's happening here. Jesus is messing up their Sabbath dinner party. (laughs) It's getting kind of annoying. (laughs) And they're trying to change the subject and shut the conversation down and go, okay, thank you very much. We're good. We're good. We're all good. Blessed, now notice this. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. This isn't just like this nice saying of like, isn't it great? Blessed is this. What this is saying is great, Jesus, that you've highlighted all the things that is going on around this table, kind of convicting. I don't want to deal with it. So here's what I'm going to say. Isn't it great that we're all good? See, we're born Jewish. We're, we're actually doing the law according to the way we believe the law is to be done. I get the surrounding people that aren't able to engage in this, but there's some reasons they aren't. Isn't it good that we're good? See, it's called vertical morality, where I can believe that I'm good with God and think I'm good with others, or I'm just okay that others aren't even good. Let me say that again. It's a little confusing. Vertical morality is this idea where I'm okay as long as I believe I'm good with God. And I'm okay if you're not. And I'm okay to be, I think it's okay to be good with God and us not good. Jesus says that that doesn't fly. The, The Jewish had this morning prayer. Men, they would pray, thank God I'm not a woman. I'm not a slave. And I'm not a Gentile. Thank God we're good. And I don't care whether you're good or not. Now, it makes sense, Jesus' reply. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything's now ready. You're invited. You're seated at the table. But they alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Like they didn't see the field before they bought it. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Like you didn't try them out before you bought it. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. Sounds like a good enough excuse, but you got the invitation. You knew when it was. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and of the town and bring the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant says, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. God desires, his heart is that there are no empty seats around the table. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them, urge them to come so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So if the first thing that keeps us from the table of Jesus is it's just too personal, and we move into our, I'm too important, and we get as, as too messy. Th- this last excuse, um, I think it's the Silicon Valley excuse. And it doesn't matter whether you're a college student or a CEO, we have the same excuse. I'm just too busy. In fact, 
if I ask you, how are you doing? In fact, I did it in the middle of service. How are you doing? Busy. Just busy. Just so busy. What are you busy with? Well, of course we're busy. I mean, if you're a college student, you got, you know, tests to cram for and papers to write and friends to hang out with and work to be had. You're, you're a young professional. I mean, you're just trying to cut your teeth and make it in the environment. So you're, you know, putting in 70, 80 hours of work. Uh, you're, you know, maybe working in different environments or now you're, you got new uh, level of something at work. What am I? What was it? Huh? Promotion. Thank you. You got a promotion, and now you have more on your plate. I'm just so busy. Busyness is the excuse we hide behind that keeps us from intimacy with others or telling the truth of what's really going on. There's actually only two people, I think, that can say they're truly busy. And the rest of us, we just make a lot of choices. Okay? So hang with me. I want to prove that we're not too busy. Okay? Not too busy for Jesus. Not too busy to grow together in Him. If you stopped for a week all social media, how much time would that open up? Did you know you can actually check it on your phone in Apple? I don't know about other Android phones. How much time you spend on apps? If you didn't Netflix binge that series, how much time would you have? The reality is, is yes, we're busy. Yes, life's going on. But the truth is, we're simply choosing other things instead. I remember my wife when she was in college, um, she had this, and she really gave her life to Jesus her freshman year of college, and it was one of those moments where, yeah, you just experienced Jesus, and you're like, I want more of him, and I, I was in Chicago, she was at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and we're talking, and on Fridays, every so often, like once a month, she would have a date, day, night with Jesus. I'm like, talk about college, you got all things going on, and you can do whatever, it's how you choose to spend your time. She's like, you know what, I'm going to go to a coffee shop, and I'm going to go with my Bible, and I'm going to go with a book and a journal, and I'm just going to spend time with Jesus because, man, he's changed my life, and I want more of him. And then the community, their dorm community, or actually their house, was centered on Jesus. See, yes, you have a full life, but busyness is an excuse we hide behind. It's choices we make. So who are the two people that are actually busy? Brand new parents and single parents. I'm neither of those. I have kids that are in the teenage stage now in, in elementary. Man, when you have a brand new parent, it, like you're being woken up, you know, 13 times in the middle of the night, you're being spit up, pooped on, throwed up on, you you're trying to function, and you can't really function. I get it, and I remember those seasons because it was the most lonely time I can remember in my life. By the way, if you're single, if you're a college student, you know a brand new parent, serve them. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if our brand new parents had, had an army of people who would love on their kids so that they could get some space to table with Jesus and with others, and we were that kind of church. You know the other people who are too busy? Single parents. Think about having to work a full-time job, having to be both mom and dad, having to run back and forth, and all the pressures and demand. I got tremendous respect, and we want to help you if that's in your, where you're at, and we want to be a community that surrounds them and says, hey, we can shoulder the burden with you. And we have lots of singles, 60% single in this church, so we should be able to shoulder the burden for our brand new parents and single parents. Yeah. Amen by myself. Excuse number four. I'm just too busy. Let, 
let me close this way. The heart of God is that there's no empty seat at his table. And God has invited you to the table. The question isn't your invitation. What I love about Jesus, this is so profound. Jesus didn't give up on the Pharisees and the religious leaders or the tax collectors and sinners. I would have given up on the Pharisees and religious leaders long before they decided to kill me. Acts chapter 6 gives us one of the recaps of how the church is growing. We'll see it through the book of Acts that there's, there's these kind of summary statements of what's happening in the life of the church. You know what it says in Acts chapter 6? And a great number of priests were being added to the faith. The very ones who conspired to kill him then came to repentance, and they had a seat at the table. The question, is not your invitation, no matter where you come from, what you've done, or where you've been? But the question I just want to leave you with, I'll invite the band up, is what is keeping you? What is keeping you from the table of God? Would you stand and we'll close? Jesus, thank you for this moment. Thank you for the time with my brothers and sisters. And your desire in this moment is is to meet each person right where they're at, to, to bring your grace, to draw them to yourself, to bring healing and wholeness. And sometimes that's hard, and sometimes that's exposing, and often in all the times that's uncomfortable. So God, I pray that you would give us the courage to lean into what you're asking us. In Jesus' name.